Thank you. And thanks again to all of the organizers and to everyone for being uh, such wonder wonderful audience members and, and uh, fostering such productive dialogue through this conference. <laughs> I've been working since 2008 in Unamagi, the ancestral lands, uh, one of the regions of the Mi'kmaq or Cape Breton Island, you might know it as, in Nova Scotia, New Scotland, in Canada's Atlantic coast, a place made Scottish and tartanized through more than a century of tourism heritage and education policies that overwhelmingly emphasize the region's Scottish and Gaelic antecedents. So for the first one of the day, okay, there we go. My work is with a much greater diversity of people on the island and the work I will discuss today concerns private collections that through my research were deposited into local government archives, those of people of Ukrainian ancestry. These private collections hold a few surprises, such as a 78 RPM of Paul Robeson, a Black American known uh, musician known for his extraordinary voice and his communist politics, and this connect with Cape Breton's major role in labor and activism, in which people of East and Central European ancestry were heavily involved, though their contributions have not yet been recognized in history and public memory. And a paper thin translucent album recorded in the early 1950s at a Ukrainian family's kitchen table in Sydney's ethnically diverse working class Whitney Pier neighborhood in Cape Breton, speaking to the ways that the newest technologies of the time were circulating and used in some of the most remote and economically poor post-industrial regions of North America. As it happens, these two records have not been deposited to the archive, but these recordio homemade discs were. They contain re-recorded material from commercial 78s, like some of those that I will discuss shortly. I invite you to learn more about the research I carried out with East and Central Europeans in Cape Breton broadly through a web portal that I created, working with a team uh, of tech and archive specialists and researchers, including then PhD student Yelka Vukovrakovic, who I invited to Sydney, or through collections at the Beaton Institute and archives. Today, I will focus on two groups of 78 RPMs that came in with two prominent Ukrainian family collections, Recordings of <clears throat> Ukrainian fiddler Pablo Humenyuk, one of the biggest stars of early 20th century ethnic recordings, we were chatting about that earlier, on big labels like Colombia, and Bandura records. The Bandura, you see it pictured here, is a plucked cordophone or zither. It's often called Ukraine's national instrument. Since the Middle Ages, the instrument has been used by Kobzars singers who wandered the countryside, accompanying themselves as they sang traditional ballads, oral histories, heroic epics, and moralistic tales. By the 1920s, a strong Bandura ensemble tradition was widespread in Ukraine, and the instrument traveled outside Ukraine in the hands of immigrants to places like Prague, Munich, London, Vojvodina, to Australia and South and North America, where I will attend today. This presentation draws on very recent and very preliminary research. My thanks to Nyla, um, and really I came here for Nyla and I met all of you, this is really wonderful, and her fantastic team of colleagues for organizing this conference and providing us a deadline so that we can share some observations with you and with the hope of you sharing insights and feedback with us that will help us prepare a large grant application to fund a multi-year Ukrainian diaspora music research project. The US includes me, a faculty member, ethnomusicologist and dance ethnographer by training, working in community engaged and community led research, and Julian or Julian Katasti, Bandurist, musician, composer, conductor, teacher, and co researcher, with whom I've been working for 25 years. This is the Bandurist that you see here. Julian and I are both of Ukrainian ancestry. We were born in Canada and the United States, respectively. My grandparents arrived can to Canada before the First and Second World Wars and built farms in the Western Canadian prairies in Alberta and Saskatchewan. They came as economic migrants looking to build a better life. Julian's parents came to the US after the Second World War as refugees with dozens of members of a Bandura Capella ensemble that had clung together through the war and displaced persons camps in Austria before they settled together in Detroit. In Detroit, these Bandureste, the Capella Imene Tarasa Shevchenka, concertized and recorded music. Julian moved from Detroit to New York in his early 20s and is largely based there, though for the past 40 years he has been traveling the world concertizing and teaching Ukrainian music. <laughs> 
He's also a Canadian citizen, having lived and worked in both countries. So he's kind of a modern day Kobzar. Julian inherited a tradition. He's a third generation Bandurist. He augmented his knowledge through a lifetime of research and engagement with traditional knowledge and documented historical practices around the world. And he studied music in university and performs and records with the diversity of contemporary musicians. He's recorded with some of the folks on the Silk Road Ensemble and, and uh, griot musicians. In 2021, shortly before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Julian received in person in New York and directly from the hand of Ukraine's President Zelensky, the award, the Slujani Artist Ukraine, Honored Artist of Ukraine. So here I advocate for including such community-based practitioners and research on their own terms. And this is to acknowledge his contributions to this work as a knowledge co-creator. This presentation focuses on materials that I initially collected and deposited into government archives. And now Julian and I are working together to interpret them. Today, I draw your attention to what we can begin to learn about the experiences and communities of people of Ukrainian ancestry in diaspora, from the creation, the content, and the circulation of music recordings in and between communities, how music informs our senses of self and community and nation in diaspora, as well as how we use music to create our worlds, our homes, and relationships. This concert pictured here is part of an artist residency that Julian and I enjoyed last weekend. It's the reason that I missed the first day of this conference. And I'm sorry, Mark, I missed your talk. I invite you to check out the exquisite live recordings of the concert online at our YouTube. It's a benefit for Ukraine. The album you see, I produced in 2014 as part of a project with Yoshko when he visited for a symposium. This album is in process now to be re-released with Smithsonian Folkways recordings this year. Let me focus now on Unamagi, Cape Breton Island. As Ukrainians, much of our history and experience is characterized by Russian colonialism. We are all seeing the continuing impacts of this in the war over the past year. Up until this last year and resulting increased interest in Ukraine and Ukrainians, when I would talk about having Ukrainian ancestry or speaking the language, most people in North America at least, would typically say something like, well, isn't that the same thing as Russian? <coughs> and when I gave my first lecture in ethnomusicology in Toronto in the 1990s on Ukrainian folkloric music and dance, a male student stuck up his hand in the discussion period afterward and stated in a strong Russian accent, well, they're all just Russians, little Russian. When I began to do research in Cape Breton in 2008, I learned very quickly about Scottish cultural hegemonies and hierarchies there, and how people of Ukrainian ancestry are nearly at the bottom. Due to the overwhelming recognition given to Scottish and Gaelic settlers, other local groups, both indigenous and settlers, have been overshadowed in scholarship and public memory, despite the great diversity of indigenous and settler groups and their activities. This provides a context for my focused look at the two groups of records that I mentioned earlier, Humanyuk and Bandura recordings. So let's focus now on those two groups of records. Much like the production of race records marketed to people of African ancestry in the US, large recording companies, Columbia, Victor, OK Records, they created catalogs of recordings marketed to ethnic groups, including Ukrainians, Poles, Romanians, Slovenians we heard about earlier, and Hungarians. Where I grew up in Western Canada, um, in prairie farm country in the 1970s and 1980s, amidst thousands, hundreds of thousands of families of Ukrainian ancestry who had settled and established farms there from the late 1890s through the Second World War, after and as part of efforts to remove and contain Indigenous peoples to reserve lands, Humanyuk's recordings were foundational in my sound world, and to this day they remain the canon at the heart of Ukrainian music and culture in Canada. I'm just going to play a small example for you quickly um, of one of those recordings. I'm going to navigate all this tech and it's not working right because, of course, that's the way it's going to be. Marcia folders. I went to the wrong one. And it's not here. The folder is all the way to the left. Thank you. Sorry. 
okay, that's Zaporozhye Herz um, with a little skip. So there we go. And I'm going to go from current slide, right? There we go. It's uh, for theatrical dance as it happens. I discovered Hominyuk's recordings in people's homes in Sydney, a region where people came from Europe starting in the late 1890s to the Second World War to work instead of farms in the steel plant and coal mines. Also in the private collections of Ukrainians, I found Hungarian, Romanian, Slovenian, and Czech recordings, including, by the way, the Hoyer Trio we heard about earlier, and books and pamphlets in these languages and in what is being called Yugoslavian. These materials nuance the documentary record related to labor history and politics in the region. Their existence changes dominant narratives that suggest people of Scottish ancestry solely are the protagonists. My research also informs understandings of early 20th century Eastern European identities and communities and cultures, which focus pretty much exclusively on the agricultural Ukrainian settlers of the Western prairies or the post-displaced or post-World War II displaced persons who settled in Toronto and Montreal. Looking more in depth at this musician and the recordings, Pablo Hominyuk was born in the village of Western Ukraine. He studied music in St. Petersburg and then immigrated to the US to New York in 1902. There he had a band much in demand for weddings and dance parties, and he frequented the East, the Ukrainian store on East 7th Street called Surma, much like that uh, fellow had a store in Cleveland that was a cultural center we heard about earlier for Slovenians. One day in 1925, a record producer from OK Records came into the Ukrainian Surma shop looking for Ukrainian musicians to record. And immediately Surmach, the shop's owner, recommended Humanyuk. These first recordings were originally marketed as Romanian Horus. It was common practice, as we heard, of the large Ukrainian or American record companies to recycle Eastern European recordings from one ethnic group to another. There is much to be said about Pavel Humanyuk, whose name was also sometimes printed as Pavel Humanyak when marketed to Poles. His recordings became the canon of traditional Ukrainian music in North America and dance. Recordings like this one I played, it's the top red one, are of music recorded to accompany the choreography of Vasil Avramenko, who traveled around North America, teaching dance and popularizing theatrical Ukrainian dance, which continues to be a major cultural activity in diaspora communities throughout the world and homeland. As well, Humanyuk recorded theatrical skits, I'm mentioning this for the fellow who was interested in the skits yesterday, a mix of spoken word and music, it's a beloved bunch of albums and artists named on this album, Zhukovsky and Plavetska and the green one, they're part of those skits. Please note that in this image of Humanyuk found at the Library of Congress, it notes a quote, Russian Ukrainian division catalog of Columbia Records. I grew up with Humanyuk recordings and covers of them by contemporary bands in dance classes and concerts at weddings and Zabava dance parties. And when I learned years later of the recycling of Humanyuk's records among Eastern European groups, I was annoyed about it, thinking it was due to the English language American company's lack of understanding of distinctive Slavic peoples and lingering aspects of Russian colonialism. However, my research in Cape Breton has since helped me to further nuance this understanding. By the Second World War, steel and coal industries had all but collapsed in Cape Breton, so virtually no immigrants came there after World War II. The Ukrainians who came prior to World War II mostly didn't even use that term for themselves, but Galician or Rusin or the Rusanian, reflecting the region of Austro-Hungarian Empire from which they immigrated, though they held Austrian passports. And in Sydney, a relatively small place in numbers of people, these Ukrainians settled and lived and worked very closely with many other groups who had come from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, including Croats and Poles and Slovenians and Hungarians and Jewish people. While these people did understand themselves as distinct from one another with their own languages and histories and culture, and while there are even today some persistent underlying tensions, between them, they also talk, all of them, about how they lived really harmoniously and cooperatively, and there's evidence about that, and they shared a great deal. For, and even though they had their own musics, they even shared musics. For example, Jewish people danced the Polomeka, and in 1928, when a Ukrainian dance instructor trained by Avramenko came to town to establish a dance school at Sydney's Ukrainian Hall, he wanted a live ensemble to play music for their premiere performance, so he enlisted the local Croatian Tamborice Orchestra to learn the music from Humanyuk's Columbia Records. 
To give some idea of the strength of identification with the Austro-Hungarian Empire of that period, you may know that Ukrainians were interned in Canada in work camps during the First World War. For the sake of political expediency, people of Ukrainian ancestry in Canada who advocated for reparations in the 1980s and 90s don't generally talk about the fact that Ukrainians were not interned because they were Ukrainian, but because they held Austrian passports. To illustrate, archival records document a visit that a Ukrainian priest in Cape Breton made to Ukrainian men interned at the Marble Mountain coal mine. He urged them to tell the authorities that they were in fact Ukrainians, not Austrians as their passports and indicated. And they said to him, Ocha, father, when we requested passports to come to this country, we took an oath to the Emperor Franz Josef, an oath before God. We cannot betray that oath or we will be sent to hell. It hasn't ever made sense to me to think of identity or nationhood as bounded or immutable. I am grateful for how this group of recordings is allowing me to demonstrate the fluidity and situation specific aspects of Ukrainian-ness and identities and alliances and allegiances and music as a compelling space and artifact for negotiating experiences of diaspora Ukrainians. In the last part of today's presentation, I would like to discuss briefly one other group of records that I found in the Ukrainian personal collections uh, in Cape Breton. In light of a long working relationship with Julian Katasti and a number of recent artist residencies as we prepare toward a bigger project, I've been exploring with him all of the Bandura records <clears throat> in the collection. I began super simple. I just looked up all the records that have Bandura printed on them. And I'll switch it again. There we go. The first two, Bandura, in this case, the light colored one, in this case, it appears only to be a label name. It's the instrument is iconic of Ukrainian culture. So somebody wanted to make sure people knew they were Ukrainian recordings. In the second one, the Stinson recording, it was ripped. It looks like from a Soviet recording of a large Bandura ensemble there, typical of the socialist regi regime. These two, they look very similar, but there's an important difference. The burgundy one, it's that Bandura Capella from the Detroit. Named for Taras Shevchenko, the Ukraine's poet laureate, the first person to publish in vernacular Ukrainian. He, this, this Pandora Capella came to Detroit. It's Julian's great uncle uh, and father played in it. Eventually, Julian, his Katasti there, he's one of the conductors. Two conductors are there, Volodymyr Boshek. He was the conductor of the choir ensemble more in the camps, and Katasti was of the uh, instrumentalists. They came to, they, together to work together, and then they were both conducting together when they got along. In the early years that they were in Detroit, they could do this together. But then there were tensions, you know, as there are in ensembles and things. And then Katasti was no longer with them. And so you see in the blue one, it's only Boshek at the conductor. So we know that Katasti has gone already. So what are the others? Uh, the Burgundy one, Ukrainian records. Given the content, insurgent songs, so that is uh, Upa after World War II, there were insurgency uh, after World War II ended, it did not end for uh, Ukrainians who were fighting for autonomy. Um, definitely that is uh, not made in Ukraine as it says it is actually. So uh, it's what we and believe is that the elder Katasti made it, it's some of the stuff that he wanted to record with the ensemble, but he never could, right? one of the reasons he left. So before he went to California, he did this recording. Um, and then uh, Surma, remember Surmach, that guy in New York who had this store, Humanyuk and the OK Records and stuff. So he got into the record business himself too, right? And this is a smaller ensemble in Octet led by a Bandurist who was in the DP camps with the Capella guys. But when he came to the States, he came to New York instead of Detroit and he was kind of doing his own thing in his life and in his music. So before even listening to these records, they have already given rise to more information about Bandura histories in North America and Ukrainian communities than I have ever heard in the previous 25 years working with Julian, talking to several major Bandura figures in different regions of North America and outside of North America, reviewing literature and archival materials. So in this case, this rather small collection of records in a remote archives has already led to a complex understanding of who the relatively specific group of Bandura related refugee Ukrainians were and their relationships and movements in the time. There's an evidently a great diversity of thought and experience and interest. So we begin to see 
by looking at these records, how they set out in many different pathways, ideological, conceptual, and actual through North America, pathways we can trace only through music recordings. So I'm gonna conclude now, and if you'd like to hear a record of this, I can play this in the, in the question period. What are some of the bigger questions and issues? Because I'm always thinking about that. So what, what does it matter beyond, of course, the very special music that we make ourselves? Here are a few to consider right away. These records document the presence of Ukrainian people in Unamagi and a range of their activities, singing back to the overwhelming Scottish songs and narratives of the island. Studying records can help us to learn about experiences of minority and marginalized groups whose histories and contributions are generally dismissed in official and hegemonic representations of a place. And let's look not only to the history books, but also to trails of 78 RPM records circulating in the region. So I'm proposing to include knowledge from alternative, you know, non-academic knowledge holders as co-researchers, as well as alternative materials like 78 RPM records to consider and create histories of place and peoples. Also, migration and mobility are matters of widespread public concern around the world, particularly amidst refugee crises, starkly changing economic realities for migrant workers and quickly intensifying challenges facing immigrants both documented and undocumented. And the place of Ukraine and Ukrainians is not settled in this world, as we know. Musical practices are often part of these experiences and negotiations through, through migration in so many ways. Now, what about studying what is actually on the records? That requires more time and study, and hopefully we get the funding for that too. So thank you for playing your part in this uh, and for listening so kindly today. I look forward to your questions and comments.